most of you will know him as probably the hardest working man in techno business. And please welcome Mr. Wolfgang Vogt. Now, sorry for you lot that um, don't speak German, because we decided on a short notice that we, for comfort reasons, do this in German. And um, subtitles will be on page 320. And um, yeah, <coughs> actually, we might have to go back into German now and then, or to use the odd word. And we'll try to translate them as best as possible. But we have this tendency to come up with these nice little terms that sum up so much in about three syllables. And um, we found the English language is not as efficient. So, funky enough. Ooh, ooh, we're going into the deep water straight away. <clears throat> so when we were telling you on the first day, this, this is also a place where people come together and talk about things, even though they see each other every single day on their way to getting their milk, to yoga, to God knows what, getting their vodka at night. This is another occasion. And, um, Wolfgang, you're actually one of the really few people that live in that quarter in Cologne that actually are from Cologne. Um, now, when you have visitors over <coughs> to make them understand why the city runs the way it is, where do you take them usually? Give us a little tour. Well, I take them in my quarter. Hmm? Uh, where I live, it's very easy because it's, you know, the territory is very small. When hmm. we say everything is interesting is where you can throw a stone in Cologne, so it's very easy. Uh, it might not be that much amazing that people might think it is mm -hmm. because what they might know internationally from the musical side or from the culture side, because it's a very fine but very small territory, you know, and the important part is much smaller than the city, of course. So it's not hard to say. There's just a few places, as you say, a few interesting places, which might not be the places everybody expect, like big discotheques or amazing big areas where interesting new music is running the whole day. It's more like different alternative places, you know, like like the yoga place you said, no, like cafes and of course our wonderful, um, let's, uh, let's say little tower in the center of Cologne where we live and where we do all our things together, me, my friends, my colleagues, all under one roof in a way mm -hmm. and just just hanging around in places which are really closed, some favorite restaurants, some small favorite clubs, but not the big thing compared to, let's say, to Berlin, for example. Cologne is, is a village in a way. It's a very nice and fine village, but it's a village, you know. What do you take them for tourist things? Well, to the cathedral, of course. Mm -hmm. To galleries, no. It's just I would I would say if 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 we have visitors or friends, business wise, you know, first of all you show them around in your in your own house in your own territory, mm. and then you bring them to your favorite restaurants and to a few pubs. There's a certain an interesting tradition in Cologne, which the music we stand for, also the the minimal techno scene or the ambient scene, it's much more played in pubs for example, than in clubs, because the situation from, from, the, from the architecture side, um, it's, it's very difficult in Cologne. Venues are very expensive, they close very fast, and on the other side, there's a certain contradiction in Cologne tradition. It's, there has not been so many good clubs that people might expect from the musical side, which we have, but from time to time, when there is good places and good clubs, um, they might not be open so long because on the other side, P Cologne people, they are very special and very lazy in a way. They all want to go out inside the center in a way and don't want to go too much to far places compared to Berlin, for example, where people every night travel by, by tram or taxi, like kilometers to go to their favorite clubs. And in Cologne, this tradition is... It's, it's different, you know. They used to go very close next door to the pubs with a few people hanging around, secret places, not so well known, drink their wonderful coach, which, which is the local beer in Cologne, and hanging around just in pubs and listening to this kind of music. Mm. And with some dance floors are full with 10 or 15 people. <coughs> so a lot, of, a lot of talk, less sweat then. Sorry. A lot of talk, less sweat. Yeah, both. First talk, then sweat. Um, <clears throat> what does a visitor have to do that you take him to, like, the city forests? So, 
what does a visitor have to do that you take them to the Stadtwald or the Königsforst or what something? What does he have to do? Yeah. Maybe you just have to ask me to bring him there. Yeah. It depends. I, I don't know how many people are interested to come into a city and to see a forest, you know, because first of all, this seems to be like a contradiction, you know. Um, especially, I guess, I guess you asked me because um, uh, people might know that I got a certain interest in forest, and especially in a, so in a forest around Cologne. So this is the, you know, it's, it's um, like in every big city, there's also a nearby forest, which I used to spend my free time to get inspired, you know, for, for, my, for my work in a way. But normally, um, I'm, I'm not so much into inviting people to go there because this is just a private space of inspiration, you know. So it's, it's nothing so public, hmm. even if it's official and everybody can go there. So it's a really special special one when you know like oh i'm going with wolfgang to the forest you have to do a lot for it but i don't i don't want to tell you <laughs> oh. yeah. but um <clears throat> nevertheless cologne is a relatively green city due to various historic occurrences and um and there's been a strong fascination with germans and their forests for quite a bit now um now i understand that you have been looking into that for quite a bit as well and could you probably enlighten us what the role of the forest is in German mythology, maybe? Yeah, it's hard to say. On, on the one side, uh, I got a certain personally relationship to this, and on the other side, there is, in, 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 in cultural history in Germany, there is a certain, a certain tradition which comes, uh, most of all, it's well known coming from the Romantic period of the, of the 19th century, of course, where there is a certain ideal, romantic idea in art and in pictures and in literature, of course, uh, which built this mood of the, of the German forest in a way where, uh, where people, artists or, 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 or maybe even, even writers find their inspiration in, in, a, in a fantastic way in moods and in, and in fairy tales, of course, which is also represented in a certain kind of music and of course in a certain kind of very serious, dark, mm -hmm. and even sometimes nearly depressive music. Um, if, if you see, let's say, if you see, for example, the music of Wagner, which is inspired by these impressions in a way, and also some kind of lit literature out of this time. And, um, and it's still, in a way, it's still a living tradition. Even musicians of today, some musicians of today, mm -hmm. still feel inspired by this tradition on the one side, or it might be even a certain kind of German mentality in a way that, um, uh, that people like me, for example, from time to time feel very inspired by this surrounding combined by the idea based on this, on this historical tradition on the one side and a personal impression you might have if you just walk through the forest and get in, in, uh, inspired by the surrounding uh, to explain your personal art, your music, your pictures, whatever. Um, is this our chance already to get something, get to listen to something that's inspired by the forest? Yeah, it should be. Uh, I think I got an example for this for you. Yeah. It, it's of course um, the release under the name of Gas, which is, uh, which is missing one bracket. Where is it? Ah, okay. Here is it. You see there's also the forest built in structures on the sleeve in a way which is uh, the idea also to show the, the visual side um, of the forest in a, in a way of um, electronic loop thinking and structured thinking. This is a track called Zauberberg, which is a reference um, to a book of the um, well-known uh, writer Thomas Mann. To make a long story a bit more short, everybody can imagine that this track is very long, <laughs> so we might have made some explanations in between. There might be Thank you. Uh, uh. There, there might be two main interesting things to say about this music. Um, everybody might have heard that on top of the, the well-known bass drum and the bass line, of course, there is um, some classical sounds, classical strings and harmonies in full length on top of this music. This is, uh, it's, it's the one point why it's that much remarkable that these strings are so much ahead is to, to, to make clear the difference between this kind of music and let's say classical ambient music, for example, like let's say Brian Eno or Kraftwerk, for example, 
because for me it's very important to understand that the idea behind this is an, to imagine that club and forest is something which comes together. You should imagine that there is a club situation we all might know from a dance floor. There is fog, you know, and there is only some uh, less light and you cannot really see what it is. And what I want uh, to, uh, to combine here is the idea of getting lost somewhere in a forest with no certain address, you know, somewhere between trees and leaves and combine this with the idea or the impression you might have uh, when you used to go to dark techno clubs, for example, and to combine it. And for me, it's important to say that it's the idea to combine electronic beats and real old classic music, not just ambient or electronic, so it's no keyboards, it's real samples, you know. And it's, it's the idea to bring the forest into the disco or the other way around, whatever, to merge it in a, yeah, in a, in a very special and fantastic way. <clears throat> now you're taking this whole concept live and um, you already did it in Leipzig and um, well tonight there's another occasion which is slightly different. Yeah, it's really different. You know, we, we and uh, my wonderful video companion and artist Petra Hollenbach who is sitting over there and did a wonderful uh, animation of um, the visual side of my gas project which she made to a wonderful one and a half uh, hour video which hopefully everybody will like. Uh, yeah, we got the chance and this wonderful um, invitation to play tonight in the Park Well, of course, here in, in Barcelona, which is, first of all, definitely not the typically place where um, you imagine this project gas might be shown, might be happen, because normally it's a total uh, contradiction, you know. It's a hall, it's columns, you know, and it's stone, and it's not wood, and it's not forest, but in a way it's wonderful, because these columns, y you, you might think if, if, this, if the visual side will work and we have a wonderful projection on them, they might look like forest, hopefully, tonight. And it's, it's, it's interesting uh, to find out how this, this show, this music, this whole atmosphere, and of course the pictures, might work on this venue. Nevertheless, Gaudi was one of these architects that put a great emphasis, like 150 years before it became fashionable, to build environmentally friendly and to integrate nature somehow in a building, as weird as that may seem, especially when you live in Cologne. Mm. Uh, sorry, once again. <coughs> especially when you live in Cologne, like mm. architecture-wise. So there's this thought of integrating nature and man-made structures in a way. Yeah. You think this is very represented in Cologne? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, no. That's what I mean. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's hard to say. It, it depends on what, what, you, what you make out of it. You know, I don't see so much contradiction between, let's say, between with ar architecture and nature. I, I see these borders flowing in, in a way, you know, not that much hard, like, like black and white. Even in this music, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's nice and it's very serious, in, sometimes in the same moment. It's, it's friendly, but it's also tired sometimes in the same moment. And this is the same contradiction in, in the material you use or in the projection you use. So f for me, if it's, it's what I see or what I make out of it. Yeah. How do you deal with time in doing these kind of tracks? Because um, they do take a little bit of space. Like hmm. You mean the length of the tracks? This music is meant to be very, yeah, let's say hypnotic, narcotic in a way. It takes the time and you as a listener should have the time uh, to listen to it. It's, the question is interesting because um, uh, people might know that um, I'm of course coming from techno and techno is uh, used to be in the 90s getting faster, harder, you know, and, and, uh, and the patterns might get shorter and shorter anyway. And people lose, lose their, their passion uh, even more and need more information and music faster and faster you know and this goes back to a very relaxed tradition um, of music which is really it's hypnotic it's relaxed and it takes its time normally it's not it doesn't make sense to step to these kind of records normally you should start at the beginning and listen to the end uh, and then you might know what it's all about you know but I don't think we have 50 minutes per site uh, to find this out. <laughs> <clears throat> at the same time, I mean, you're using very little elements in there, but at the same time, it's a pretty maximal sound, rather. 
I mean, there's not much space left in the frequency mm. spectrum in it. Yeah, it's filled. It, this, it's, it's minimal and it's maximum at the same time. I think it's very overloaded minimal, if you like. It's minimal in that way because it's just a few little elements and the beat, as long as there is a beat, not all these tracks have beats, are going on and on. Uh, without too many, without breaks or variations or whatever. On top, there's very uh, elegic sound scapes running through, which build their own structures because I let them run in a way, but only in a, in a certain frame. I control this because I want to have, I want to fill the whole room. I want to leave any, it shouldn't be transparent in the end, but minimal at the same time. <clears throat> Going back to the reference points, um, when the Romans came first to Germany, who actually founded Cologne, um, they mm -hmm. wrote about all those barbarians sitting up in the trees and waiting to give them a good beating. And um, the trees and, and the woods, I mean, that's all we had for centuries, literally. The most of the time, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, <clears throat> but it, it came a little, became a little bit pr more prominent when you said the romantic idea was also to create something bit bigger, a little bit more unifying thing. And, um, and there was also a certain longing, um, Sehnsucht is the German word, yeah. and which is a very strong feeling that's also, um, it's almost like it was the nation's puberty in a way, mm -hmm. as far as culture goes. And um, is that what touched... I mean, to a certain degree, you could see parallels between that and what touches people when they start listening to music at age 10, 12, or whatever. Where did you find parallels there? Um, yeah, it's hard to say. First of all, it's right what you say that, like we already said earlier, that in, in German historic and tradition and cultural tradition, there is this certain longing what, what people or what certain people think they might find in this in, in 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 the forest in a way yeah but i don't think that that we invent this it's, it's just uh, every every people all over the world you know they got their their relationship to their kind of nature and they, uh, and any artist all over the world might someday walk uh, through their natural environment and get inspired by trees you know like like, like or by, by the ocean if you like or by mountains or whatever you know, but it might be that especially in, in, in Germany there's such a strong worldwide well-known tradition uh, even in literature or in pictures you know that it's very popular uh, to, to bring this this motive of the forest this idea and this mood um, into art I cannot say if, if even even the younger generations or whatever that there's the tradition going on that they all go back to this point or feel inspired by this. Um, what I what I found out when I re-released this music, which is mainly around ten years old and it's it had been released um, half a year ago again, that it was really great to see that a lot of young people, very young, around eighteen twenty, compared to my age. Uh, they get into this music and they really like it and they take it and understand it as far as I can see as what it is, as I, what, I, what it's meant to be. And, <clears throat> okay. which, is a, which is a good surprise if you think of, uh, of, of the way people, especially young people, listen to music today. When you think on MySpace or YouTube, you wouldn't combine this, first of all, with this kind of music. But it's definitely, it's also happening there and as far as I understand, they really get into it and they understand it in their wonderful new way. Um, speaking of wonderful new ways, um, <clears throat> going back to youth and youthful things, um, there's a certain parallel in, in the motives that drove what is happening here and the same way the stuff that you listen to when you were a teenager, right? Or what were you listening to as a teenager in the first place? Oh yeah, I, I listen to every kind of music. It's it's just uh, for my age. It's a typically um, uh, long way through um, yeah through through the music history. I start listening. Of course, I get educated with uh, yeah with German folk music on the one side and with glam rock on the others in the early and mid seventies. And then I go via rock music. I came to jazz. I used to listen to jazz music later to free jazz music. And then I get in touch with new wave and pop music, electronic pop music in the 80s, you know, before I fell in love with acid house music and techno in the late 80s. 
And since then, uh, it's still, even that techno is nearly, it's around 20 years old, it's still, for me, still the bass drum is steady and it never has changed. And this, um, yeah, the, and especially the tradition of techno music, or music based on the four to the floor bass drum, yeah. took uh, half of my <coughs> musical life, meanwhile. I mean, do you got any ideas of how many records you actually did? No. Hmm. Uh, I mean, a good there, estimate. There are some some guys around at MySpace. They, I think, they know. I don't know. <laughs> Not really, a lot. But, but I mean, we maybe maybe because uh, um, uh, the most of them, you know, in the, in the fast times in the 90s when we all were very inspired, you know, and we were very wild. You, you did a lot of records which you're happy you might have forgotten today. So this might be the reason. Yeah. <coughs> Too much, I guess. Yeah. Um, I mean, we try to count at least the different um, acronyms or pseudonyms that you used and the different identities. And even there, we got past 20 easily. And um, yeah, so I mean, technically, that would mean. Do you know them all? <laughs> God, I'm not from Russia. No. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, um, yeah, there's enthusiasts around the world who know them all. But, um, but that means, like, if we would just like to present all every single one of them for like three minutes we'd be done just without and any talking time would be over yeah, yeah. Uh, but it might not be necessary uh, to to show about the, the the whole musical spectrum and the variations i did on this music i say i would say like five might be enough uh, to uh, to show a, a, re a relevant spectrum of, of what I did. There's also a lot of funny names uh, which not I only use, also my friends. It, it was like in the 90s, it was like using new pseudonyms or anonym uh, identity, which might be really nice and, and, and funny, even if you like, for just a few weeks or just for two releases, and then it's gone. The good thing at this time was that you don't need to create big identities, you know. Uh, um, just if you feel you want to do this kind of music now. You know? We learned in the 90s, we learned that music, it's also okay that a certain kind of musical idea or trend or whatever might only be interesting for a few weeks and then something new should come. Today, I would say this is different again. It's, it's going back to more, more solid and uh, more longer terms of using ideas of music. But in the 90s, also the short terms has been interesting. But despite the short terms, um, all those identities were pretty defined. Like you could pretty much differentiate like, oh, this is rather a miking track than a Studio 1 track or something. Yeah, of course. Um, maybe the difference um, is between some <coughs> very, let's say, fast working and inspired young techno <coughs> producers is that some of them might use like 10 different names uh, and do 10 different records, but they all sound the same. They all only got different names. Uh, in, in my case, it was like, I felt, I felt really inspired by this music and also this easy kind of production makes me very fast in working in a good way, you know? Um, but I always tried to make a real difference between the project and the names. Of course, like you say, Gas is something different, like you mentioned Studio 1, for example. You cannot really compare this. There's only, only one thing which has all the same information. This is the bass drum, the rest is different. Can we probably, do you have an example that's as contrary to this as possible? Of course. Of course, something the SOC is totally different to the example before. <laughs> Thank you very much. But it's also very ongoing music, you know, it's very minimal, so I guess everybody can imagine it's going on like this, more or less. <laughs> so we might stop it here to go on in the discussion. So, <clears throat> I mean, Studio 1 um, was also came at an interesting point in time as well. Like, what made you do it, in short? Yeah, it's also, this record is from um, 
96, yes, okay, and it, this was exactly like you say, it was a, a very interesting and um, inspiring time in the mid of the 90s where most of the, the main things I did and also some of my friends did and other people of course also did um, has happening uh, these days because uh, the music was changing very much in Germany. Uh, it was that uh, techno has, has was really was the big thing in the mid 90s and all kind of people from other kind of culture, from rock culture, independent culture, even from the art scene, they came into techno because they felt inspired. Uh, f five years later, of course, like like the normal techno kid already was from the early 90s, but it was a great moment because a lot of interesting people and interesting inspiration came in, and techno gets yeah gets popular and pop in a good way these days because a lot of let's say good and interesting people from different scenes coming to this music. Uh, when, when this came up, it was one of a very early example of uh, making techno really minimal. Till this point, techno was very, uh, yeah, it was very hard and it, 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 was, it was already communicated as some kind of minimal and very simple music, but it was not that much minimal. And here, it, it was a certain kind of, also a bit like an arty idea, of bringing it really down, <coughs> sorry, the main techno idea of bringing it down to the very basic, to try to invent a music which uh, with less variation as possible, to strip it down even to the bass drum and rebuild the whole architecture of techno um, and what we know about techno after in the mid of 90s, very basically with very small and very minimal samples and the, uh, mostly of uh, from very unknown uh, uh, samples w w because it was not interesting anymore and stripped down to the most minimal way at these days these days because there has not been no names no sleeves even no titles for the tracks it was just the whole language the whole secret language of this kind of music which started working worldwide uh, in in the mid of the 90s was just a mini, the, the most possible minimal musical loop information which was less information as possible. It was the maximum and the minimum at the same time. And it was of course a certain kind of aesthetic which was very, very strong, tough and has something to do with very minimal architecture in a way, you know. And at this point, uh, the glamorous side of this music, the popular side which make people dance in clubs to this, and uh, let's say the more intellectual or arty side, if you want, has come together at a historical point. And this was um, uh, the interesting thing at, uh, at this time when me and some other people started doing this kind of music, which later gets very popular in thousands of variations under meanwhile the well-known name of minimal techno, which I have to say, um, is, is the leading club music, meanwhile, worldwide, because like most of you might know, most of techno is working very basically without any vocals, without any information, just sound, little noises and structures, which people understand, meanwhile. Yeah, it's a pretty archaic, uh, not in ritual, but a archaic mm. me mechanism, I guess. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it, it was meant to be, to, to be as, as pure as possible. Me, me, for example, I had the idea, idea to make it as radical <clears throat> as possible. Till the till mid of the 90s, uh, techno is getting louder, harder, faster, bigger, mm -hmm. and even less transparent. And then there was a point when it doesn't go much more ahead, and you had to go somewhere. And the idea was to strip it down back again, to the basic information, which is the four to the floor bass drum, nothing else. And then to rebuild very carefully and control every sound, just one hi-hat, one clap, one sound, nothing less. You, uh, the idea was not to use more than three ingredients. If there would come a, a forced element, you have done something wrong. This, you, have to, you have to tell an interesting story about 10 minutes just with three ingredients, you know? Like, let's say, like a very minimal soup, for example, which only needs three ingredients, in a way. And my idea was to find something like uh, the beautiful art of nothing, or the art of leaving out, if you understand. The art of being really minimal, to, to, to explain 
a, a story, a, a full surrounded story with nearly no element, elements. The interesting thing was to make this music funky and working and danceable with what you not have said in the music and not what you put on it, uh, more than what you leave out. Um, a term you coined at the fray, uh, a term you coined at the time was um, the Enteuphorisierung des Tanzboden, which translates as like the euphor the for the euphorizing the uh, dance floor or something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, what what he meant was what was um, I think some ideas uh, we had at this time. Uh, to leave out a certain kind of um, too much hysteric uh, for energy out of the dance floor to make it more, to make um, funkiness more mathematic uh, in a way and not, not so much like beat on the drum till everybody is, you know, like, like tired. It was like, like leaving out, like being very organized. It was more like, like smart techno, like staying cool. It was cool and it was danceable, but it w was a bit more, more finger snipping. It was not so much hands in the air or it w and it was even not more sweaty anymore. Th this is what I meant at this time. But this was just the beginning of, um, of an idea. Uh, I'm happy to say uh, that the direction this music takes was uh, very much after this time it was very much euphoric again anymore. And today people, they really get hysteric to very, very minimal music, just to bass drum and one noise. And this for me is, is the, main, uh, the main information on techno, that with really nothing, just with signals, only a few people might understand on the dance floor, you can reach, you have so much effect on it. And feedback, of course. A lot of the, <clears throat> a lot of your work is about dealing with contradictions and um, living through para paradoxes, and um, there's always like, yeah. yeah, there's always these like the an antagonism to the one thesis and trying mm. to somehow find out what is in the middle. Mm. Yeah, yeah, of course, it's really true. I once said that um, uh, the the most constant thing in my work is the contradiction. In a way, this is why I used so many so many project names because it's, you're searching for something, maybe in music or in art, and when you find it, you directly then you got it, and then you you have to stay away from it and looking for something else, even for the opposite, to make this this musical idea more clear. And this is, uh, so contradiction is also a style element in a way. This, for example, is very minimal and transparent. And when you did it, you, you, you directly after you might look for something which is the opposite, which is really not transparent and it's really, it's really fat and big because the, 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 the contradiction between the flanging in between, if you like, is the interesting thing. You know that you're looking for something, and sometimes what you you search for, it's not exactly on the point where you try to find it. Is somewhere beside, you know. It's it's. I would explain it like you you're looking for certain rules, and the moment you find these rules, you break it, and then it's interesting enough because then it's wild anymore. You got you got an idea, you know what you're looking for, but then you're looking for a certain point that you don't understand it really anymore. And then it's interesting. So sometimes the main truth of a certain art idea for me is, is beside of the middle. It's not exactly that. When I said I'm looking for the absolutely black or the total beat, then it's only the way to search it is the interesting thing. When you find it, you got it, and then it's not interesting anymore. So you keep this in move. If you, if you docu, there's a kind of finding, uh, doing a documentary of the way uh, what you're searching for. What, what I want to show is not what I found, what I want to show is what I'm looking for, what I'm searching for. So this is always, it's always on the way, it's never there, because this is much more interesting. It keeps you alive in a way. Another one of those eternal quests is, um, you can call it a mensch machine or electronic funk, or this whole dichotomy between having this calculated thing and the funk soul aspect, which is rather the total opposite of it. Now, how are you dealing with those two poles? Yeah, bo both sides, of course, have their truths. You say when when you say mensch machine, a good <coughs> example. Um, 
we all think, for example, of Kraftwerk, which is mm -hmm. very um, quantized machine music, which not so much, um, let's say, human elements, like, for example, if you use um, uh, references from funk music or from music which so-called human touch. The interesting thing is to, to combine it um, and to make machines human in a way. Mm -hmm. So combining means you, you got uh, today in modern music software, you got a lot of buttons which you have you push and then you got a certain kind of human touch. It makes you swing or it makes mm -hmm. you boogie or whatever and it's really groovy <coughs> but it's not really human, uh, the, the good idea in using, in the tradition of techno and using machines is always to, to misuse these machines, you know, and to make them, uh, uh, to animate them to make mistakes, then it might get funky in a way, it might get groovy. Of course, the uh, main thing is that a lot of this kind of music is based on samples, of course, samples from other people's records or other people's music, which is handmade and it's, it's really groovy and got this typically human touch. And if you combine it with this music, it still has this human touch. But in the end, it's, you, you have to have this feeling, you have to have this groove, you understand why you do it, you know. It's even if, if you listen to music uh, in, in clubs, you feel inspired of dancing on certain tracks or you don't. Mm. It depends, it's, it's just feeling. Now this m music emerged on various places of the planet at around a similar time and um, for many of the people that started getting into the music at the late in the late 80s and the early 90s um, they were looking very much towards Chicago to Detroit and that and um, who ironically enough were very much looking to Europe for what they're doing so um, how did you find your spot on that map yeah, it's, it's true. T till the light, uh, 80s, till this music was invented, um, of course, mainly uh, in, in Chicago and Detroit, later in Berlin and so on, there was a very uh, um, a fast move worldwide. You know, techno was, was a language which uh, was, uh, was very fast in uh, getting all over the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, you, and people play back their ideas. There might be a certain record coming from Detroit, which might uh, have listened somebody in Berlin to, and he felt inspired by this, and so on and back again. It's really ironically, it's that um, in the late 80s, it was like um, uh, a lot of people, me too, for example, we really were inspired and impressed by, for example, by Chicago Acid or Detroit Techno. And when, when you met these people first who were responsible for this music, they, they even uh, were impressed by what we did or some people did in Germany or in England, for example. It was really interesting. And um, the, it was that time the music runs forward that much fast that uh, the, the history was not fast enough to, to give the right... Uh, uh, how can I explain? Um, uh, it, uh, there was not enough time to bring all these categories uh, carefully in w where it comes from, you know, because it was very fast and uh, there came so many records out at these days that it took a long time later to find out where might be roots of something, where was it coming from. We used to say at this time that techno is very a, a new radical non-verbal international language where is certain identity or, or even pop stars' identities, or even a certain kind of language, or even nationality is not necessary anymore. There's only the musical information, uh, and you like it or you don't like it, or you understand it or you don't. It was not important so much anymore, because these kind of friendly machines where we used to produce it gives a, a lot of people in a very good and democratic way the chance to produce this music as long as they feel it and as they feel inspired and they got a certain kind of musical talent, of course. So on the one hand, you're there, I mean, obviously after listening to clam rock and et cetera, which is just a little bit about the main ego there in stage that totally bears it all. There's something, you know, as, as you said, pretty radical about this stance of like taking the persona totally back and um, creating some sort of a avatar kind of character that just acts just so that you have some sort of an information to differentiate things. 
Yeah, yeah. Till techno, it was like in, 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 in pop history, it was really necessary um, yeah, to understand instrument, to have a certain identity, to get a certain knowledge, and you have to build an image, and you have to convince uh, uh, mighty record companies from what you did to bring out the record. You know, with techno, this changed radically because uh, uh, people started with, with really less money and really uh, easy alternative and radical, even uh, anarchistic ways of producing their own music. They don't care anymore what people say. They just say, we did it on our own. They pressed 1,000 records, you know, which started to get affordable at these days. And so this makes the music market very right and wild and radical and uh, makes all these old structures not necessary anymore, that you need companies or, s or some big guys in the record in industry who will tell you uh, that your musical idea is worth to bring it out or even not. They just did it and this brought, uh, for my opinion, this frees a lot of people all over the world and inspired people that, hey, this is really great, I can do this on my own, you know? And it, it makes, it, it frees really, um, makes the idea of free flowing inspiration and art uh, in, in, a never, uh, in, in a way which has never been like this before. You know, because just the ways of production is getting easier, getting more alternative, and most of all, people don't care so much about sales anymore. They just want to do this music, no matter if they get their money back or not. Fun was much more important than, let's say, selling records or whatever. And this was really good for the music. Mm. Nevertheless, the market was big enough so that all these different characters somehow could at least afford to press the record, more or less. Nevertheless, nevertheless sales were big enough that um, if certain characters pressed the record, you, even in like small amounts, it was enough to you know go on and do the next one. And yeah, yeah, it was just it was just an, a non-profit thing. It was mm. just because of the music. You know, uh, you could be happy if um, the money you spend on the record you did maybe let's say last month uh, comes back to afford the next one. Mm. Obviously, you had to learn a, a lot of those things as far as the production process goes. And um, can you still recall the tri tribulations of pressing your first one or two records? The first one, so it was really an adventure, yeah. <coughs> yeah, when we started uh, producing our own records in very early 90s, um, at the beginning it was really a, a bit more like an adventure, you know. I remember you have, we had to do it all on our own, all the, do, do the mastering and go to certain pressing plants and it was, yeah, it was a lot of jobs to do in the early beginning, but it starts getting very easier because there, there, there were structures were built very soon in the early 90s, um, even distribution, production plans and studios, which makes it a lot easier because there was a certain kind of worldwide alternative market <coughs> um, started, which makes all these things possible. In the beginning, it might be a bit difficult. Yeah, you have to learn a few things to, to do this all on your on your own. Because before, there were a lot of people between you, your music, and the production of music, and then uh, you start doing it all on your own. But it's it it was it was a very f fast thing that a lot of people learned these days. And just with a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of strength and power, you you could do it on your own. Um, I do sense a bit of a euphemism in there because I mean you kind of refine that to a stage where even in this building um, the people that haven't ever heard consciously one of your records um, would know about Compact as a label or Compact as the mini empire. Now um, it's, it's kind of a harsh um, reality that um, in this an independent market you have to like put in a lot of effort to get to a certain stage and then as soon as you just get to the bare minimum where you can live of it like all the haters are uh, coming down on you again and you're like oh hang on we're just trying to give people jobs here in a way on with like what they're doing like can you take us in like a, a little short installment of like the process of how you learned to integrate all these things in your uh, in your own house, mm -hmm. literally. Yeah, yeah. But when you when you first you you just only you see yourself as an artist or a musician, and then at a certain point the things happen we already spoke about, um, and you start doing 
you make the decision to produce, uh, to make your music free, to produce it on your own, take your own risk, and try to involve as less people as possible in the production and even in, in the outside of music, yeah, then uh, one day you have to do your decision uh, and you make your, your first tries and then you build your first label, of course. Let's say we, we, me and my partners, my friends, we have been uh, involved in this music since the very beginning. So we have always had a certain uh, parallel to the, to the whole movement from the very beginning. And it was it, in a very natural way, um, we, we built up our own label, our own company, and step by step, we built all these departments because we found out step by step, it's really better to do it on your own and not to involve too many people because it's easier because you got a very hard break even of these kind of productions. So the less people involved, the better it is uh, to protect uh, your production set and even your money, if you like. Um, and so you, you uh, slowly you build up your, your own record company in a way and start thinking about also of course the business side of these things because you have to be organized in a way otherwise you cannot afford to do your own music so you have to get in contact or to build certain structures even of marketing of publishing of licensing and all these things which might sound also boring in a way because this was all these points where you once run away from because you don't want to get in touch with so many music business people you just want to do music on the other side you have to learn at a certain point that you have to do these things and to learn these things in a certain way even if not in another way like generations before an alternative way just to survive in this music and in the 90s when this music gets popular anymore and DJ culture was really big and vinyl was really a strong market um, and um, there was really a worldwide DJ and dance market coming up we have been lucky to been part of it with our special cologne department and our cologne idea we have been involved in international techno from the very beginning but we always had this idea to find our own sound in, in the borders of techno, there was, we always said there's a typically Berlin sound, a Detroit sound, a Chicago sound, why shouldn't there be an, a Cologne sound? So, and for us, especially for me, it was important to invent um, a known slang in this international mu uh, music language techno. We tried to find our, yeah, what we call Cologne slang, like others found their Frankfurt slang or their Detroit slang. Or whatever and in the end we found out this was the best what we could do because people really mentioned that we did not try to to copy other people's music or not to try to sound like Detroit or whatever we try we take this wonderful inspiration or we take this ball coming from Detroit and kick it back with a certain kind of cologne attitude or whatever and this brings us a good, a good feedback and really respect from the other side of the world. Mm. So this is what I guess why, why labels could work when they find their own, their style, their strategy, and their, their, their own kind of music. Can you recall certain key moments of when you understood of like, okay, there's no sense in trying to be Juan Atkins or uh, God knows Larry Hurd, but I can do only Wolfgang. Yeah, for me as an artist, it was always like I went to discotheques or I went to galleries and I felt, as an artist, I felt inspired, you know. As an artist, you need inspiration, of course. You get into clubs, you listen to something, and with this idea of last club night, you go into a studio next day. But, yeah, it depends. There's a lot of techno producers who, who, really, who really are brilliant in sounding like this one or this one, and, and they do it in a good way. And it's also possible in techno to work like this, but for me it was always the other way around. I had never the idea to, to copy anybody's music in this way. Of, of course, there's a certain sound, there are rules, there are certain kind of instruments. <coughs> if, if you use an 808, for example, a, a drum machine, or you use a certain, certain machine like whatever, like, like a 303, or today if you use Ableton, if you like, of course there are similarities in the sound. If you take the same sound, of course, you, you, you sound like somebody else, but it's not important that there are certain elements in the music which sound like somebody else. It's important what comes on top, 
What, what is your own part in your music? What do you make out of it? Also, it's not important who you sample, it's important what you make out of this sample. You know, and uh, it's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that in techno there's a lot of people who might not really understand this in a full way, but they understand by heart that there's something uh, very special in this music, that somebody has an own idea and an own musical language. But this is just, it was not a strategy I might have someday or somebody else. It's just, it's just my nature, you know. Um, <clears throat> now, people do generally learn a lot about or through emulating other things. And um, so, as a good German, you now and then try to doing music that moves you in like the hip region is not exactly our most nature-given thing. I mean, German by nature aren't the funkiest people on the planet. Uh, of course not, no. no. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so, and um, if you look at the body of your work, you dealt with it quite offensively and went through like very particular elements that are as far away from the funk as possible and try to incorporate them into like a dance floor scenario. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Fun funkiness, in you know, it's, it's a very special thing. It's, it's we, we had uh, also in like in the 90s again, we had a lot of uh, discussion about... Damn those 90s, oh, God. Damn those 90s, okay, uh, like what is funky? Well, funky is just a certain kind of rhythm feeling, of course, you know. Yeah. First of all, funk is it's black music coming out of the disco tradition from the late mm -hmm. 70s. But it's just to explain a certain kind of groove. You can be funky with machines, of course. Today you got plugins, plugins with certain patterns. They are f funky because uh, the software is programmed like that, you know. So it's it's hard to say where's the border in being funky. Of course, uh, a lot of my music has been funky in a way, or, or was, uh, or people thought it was funky. Um, there's a lot of ways of being funky, you know, and it's, uh, it, it, it's hard to say. Even, it's still, the bass drum is steady and it's very mathematic. It's combined. There's some very mathematic, more, let's say, more German groove ideas, like we might know from Kraftwerk, for example, combined with funkiness. If you, if you just scratch around a bit with beats and listen to it, then you see that if you cooperate with your machines and your sampler, right, music might get funky very fast just by accident or by influencing or pushing machines to make certain kinds of mistakes. So grooves get laid back and so we're very, fa very fast that we're into funky music, which does not mean that, for example, me, like normally a not funky German, I play bass, educated like a funky bass player from, you know, from, 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 from the human side here. It's, it's combined with machines. You know? mm. But nevertheless, this is probably the interesting point because, I mean, not everyone learned to play jazz in somewhere in, in the southern states near the Mississippi or, or the blues or whatever. And most of us here come from somewhere else than where the music that they idolize is actually coming from. And how, what are the tactics to get into doing you and putting your own influences and your own identities in there? Yeah, with, with sampling, for example, with this production way of sampling, you, you can use uh, the whole music history in a way, even if you like, in a respectless way, like a big supermarket where everything is available, in a way. Of course, we, we all, also me, I'm, I'm, I'm educated and influenced by English and American pop music in the 70s and 80s, and this was, was the main influences, of course. But, in the end, when you start doing your own music, uh, me, for example, I never tried to be like my idols from the 70s or 80s or whatever. As, you, as we already said, I tried to combine it with very own and special idea. I tried to mix traditions and styles, and also I always tried to mix contradictions. For example, let's say um, funky-based music coming out from disco music from the 80s or 70s, combined with, let's say, uh, even German Schlager or Volksmusik, which inspired me to combine music which is normally forbidden to combine, or it might be a certain contradiction which you might not understand um, I guess you would need to um, elaborate on Schlager or Volksmusik, because huh? they're probably not the most 
ah, well-known terms okay. around the world. But it's not the most well-known term, <laughs> of <laughs> course. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I heard that the, that the term Schlager or the term Kitsch, for example, mm -hmm. is very well-known. Yeah, this is the typically um, based also uh, on, on on German language-based pop music, which uh, my parents used to listen to, which I don't know what the English word for Schlager is, because um, uh, I understand why this, this term is not existing, you know, in the international music language, or even, let's say, like, like, like marching music, or like, or maybe like polka music, or folk music, even, might be influence, influences which might not fit to techno or to funky music, but uh, for me, from time to time, it was interesting to combine these uh, these tendencies, which are normally uh, full of contradiction. Yeah. Um, on an interesting side, how would no. you explain German Schlager music to the people? I think it's not. Un really unfortunately, I got no listening uh, examples <laughs> of no. this kind of music, which I might to play to you. But I guess it's it's probably I don't know adult pop music in a way. Sorry, what? It's probably adult pop music in a way. It's yeah. the, the pop music yeah. that yeah. people that aren't really it's into pop, it's pop youth music culture. for your grandmother, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, but but I mean the interesting thing is I mean obviously it's hugely popular and Saturday night shows are filled with it. And um, interestingly enough, the steady bass drum, the electronic steady bass drum, rules supreme in that genre these days. I mean you can't listen to any of those folks music shows on, on yeah. TV without getting yeah. electronically produced beats in there. Yeah, yeah it's what we say meanwhile the, 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 the bass drum, the four to the floor bass drum is it's it's meanwhile it's existing in any kinds of music, even in the in trivial ways of music and into strange entertainment music, you know, and in what we say, I don't know if you understand the word beer tent music, for example, and and for drinking hymns and whatever, it's all based on a certain kind of techno. And even the the worst and strangest and trivial things, as uh, sometimes Mima, are based on on techno beats. Not all of these tendencies uh, are really w worth listening to, uh, but but some I found are not so uh, are interesting in a way, because it also shows how far techno uh, has has gone. Meanwhile. Um, that's probably a good way to come back to Studio One, uh, Studio Eins, and some of your um, old productions, is because um, those were to a certain degree almost a political statement as well as um, for that little irritation that for years people have been fighting to make techno a major force in popular culture, and all of a sudden it was so popular that, um, yeah, from those Saturday night evening shows to two million people at the Love Parade and, um, I don't know, walking tampons and giant inflatable um, mobile phones and all these atrocities that, um, yeah, it was like, hang on, is this really what we want? And so before, there was, there was also this almost political element of reducing it to the strobe light the fog machine and a bass drum, in a way. Yeah, I, th I, I've, I always felt that we have to see that every musical trend has has to move forward in a way to stay interesting. Uh, on the one side, uh, it's of course techno comes from the very underground. It was very pure, minimal for a certain kind of so-called well-known people or the ones who have, have been there. It was very alternative, minimal, radical. Um, and it was just in the beginning strobe light, bass drum, and a few people, and then it's getting more popular, popular. Um, I would say uh, when, when the, the direction uh, techno, techno takes when it gets more into pop music and it gets into the very, um, in, even into Love Parade and to two million people dancing on the street to techno in the very beginning, for me it was a good direction because it was the music we stand for and it was good to see how popular it could get. get. Of course, the more popular any music trend gets, uh, uh, you know, the, the more problems come. The more people get involved, also the more maybe silly people get involved, of course. Um, but after all those years in, when techno has been very commercial and has also shown very very strange and also, let's say, very ugly sides of, of getting popular. Um, it's still existing and it's for me, it's still, it's not new anymore, but it's still the most important kind of dance music worldwide. And, it's, and 
I think that techno is still very fast and still able to get back to its roots again and again and get stripped down back to the underground, to the basic, only to the bass drum, and invents itself new every few, few years. Not that much anymore like in the early years, of course, but if you see other musical trends or tendencies like, like I don't know, rock music or whatever, um, they never have been refreshing and getting underground again and again like it is in techno music. It's, it's my feeling. Normally after 20 years a musical trend definitely it's dead and it's only established. Techno for me is established on the one side but it's still the most radical music uh, dance music available. This might be only because there's nothing new really which comes instead. Normally after a trend, the next trend comes. For me in musical history, techno was the last big subcultural trend which mobiles a lot of people worldwide. And so at the moment we got at the point that it's, of course it's not new anymore in a way, and of course there might be a lot of people stay away meanwhile, but there's nothing newer available, you know, there's no alternative. I like to say after techno always comes techno. <clears throat> so, jumping 12 years back, back to um, first Studio 1 releases, you're quoted saying, after six years of producing music, um, technically and aesthetically, everything is said and done, and it's just about refining it anymore. Now, this is 12 years later, so twice that time. Did you? At, at this point you mentioned, for me, um, after uh, a few years of getting really inspired and did a lot of records in Thousand Variations, uh, there was a point that from my side everything was, was said and done in this music. Which does not mean that I was not interested anymore, it was just that I want to have um, uh, to stop my crea creativity in a way and uh, fix on another point and I get interested in uh, in, in, in the marketing side, of course, and starting, uh, starting up the, uh, building up the label and the business side, which was also a big chance and it was interesting for me after years of only doing music, um, getting a bit more organized and also uh, um, pushing uh, up uh, a lot of uh, young, young artists, young producers, which surrounded me these days and um, sent wonderful, inspiring demos, which were based on this kind of tradition, in a kind of new techno music which I wanted to do like this because I felt like I already did it but I also found, found enough fresh energy and fresh, and, um, uh, fresh ideas in younger people's techno productions which I and me and my friends we decided to push and to bring forward and to release on our uh, label Compact uh, in Cologne and I get for, for like a few years then I get concentrated just on um, creating um, a certain frame, a platform for other people's music, but it still was techno and it still was progressing and there was still coming up new ideas from young fresh producers. Even, even if it was only a new generation of software and a new generation of the way they produce, there were still enough things to say. It was not that much glamorous anymore and that much radical new and revolutionary like it has been years before, but it was still the most revolutional musical option we might have. Because uh, for me, it was never the question to go back to jazz or to rock music. Did you at any stage have the moment where you thought like, oh damn, I used to be Mike Inc, the producer, now I have to be Wolfgang, the business person? Uh, as we have said already before, uh, um, my, 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 my career has been full of contradictions, so it was not really, really uh, really difficult for me. Uh, I could combine this all, all in one person, all under one roof. So it was not really a problem. But earlier when you mm -hmm. started elaborating on this, um, I saw a few um, alarm bells going off and like, <laughs> damn, I want to be a producer. I want to be in my studio doing my thing and contracts, Excel sheets, all that stuff. Can someone else please take care of this? No, at a certain point, yeah. After, after, after all, I have done this and I found out to handle Excel sheets and, and, and statements and whatever you want. And I fell in love into the bureaucratic side of music, which was really interesting for me for a certain time because I handled it also li like art in a way. For me, it was like, yeah, 
I, I did it with the same energy I used to do my music before. I used to handle all these more boring things and all these Excel things, like you say. Um, till a certain point, you know, uh, every, every period needs its time. I, I, I really I felt inspired uh, and I had to say a lot to these things and it was fun to build up with my friends these companies, these structures and on top of this give a lot of people the chance and the platform to bring out all their wonderful music. But then uh, a certain point comes when I said, okay, now it's enough. Um, and meanwhile, I was surrounded by good people who supported me and helped me. Like it is in a traditional company, you get bigger and then a lot of people who might come in uh, and could do this job much better than you, organizing all these paperwork and all the stuff, which gives me the chance uh, to follow my upcoming feeling again to get back to my creativity and get back to my music. As when the break was long enough, the, you know, your creativity comes back and the ideas come back and the need and the strength, the power to, to go back to your own music. Is then when it's strong enough, it finds its way and then there's only one way, go back to your music. When you <clears throat> ever find yourself surrounded by, uh, by businessmen in one room full of businessmen, um, you'd be surprised how many times you hear the word creative in there. Like everyone is like an artist in there. Can you run yeah. a company creatively? Of course, of course. Business and creativity for me is no contradiction. It fits very well together. I have always been very creative while also been a businessman, you know, because this is the, uh, this is where my energy comes from, you know. I've never studied or was too much interested in any kind of business things and it was never my main goal just to rule a successful company just for business or just for money, you know. For I, I would say, I guess we have been successful in what we did because we said music comes first and then comes money. Of course it's important if you want to have a free and successful company, you have to understand some certain busy things, of course, it's, it's important. But it's not the main thing. The main thing is to understand music and to understand how to handle music. So can you probably, to give us an idea of where you are now, um, take us on a virtual tour through that building that people on the streets in Cologne call the bunker. The bunker? Yeah. Uh -huh. you, yeah. You, you mean uh, from, from the business side, from, from our no, building? No, just like, let's say we open the door and uh, like what, what are the things that we got on the one roof? Uh, on the one roof, what do we got? We got, um, yeah, we got our wonderful company Compact, of course, which is uh, f for Cologne, uh, more or less wonderful and big building in the center of Cologne. Um, and of course, um, it's, yeah, what, what he says when he means Aula on the, on the, on all under one roof is that we live and work and eat and produce and sell and whatever our idea of music uh, which means we got our wonderful record shop downstairs and the distribution where we handle all this still the physical e a techno market with records and CDs and we got um, a big creative floor in the first floor with our office with all our departments for booking and licensing, label work, artwork and all these things, production. Yeah, and then we got a wonderful uh, communication uh, uh, store in the second floor where we get our kitchen where we all come together around like 20 people who are working for us in our still alternative music company. Yeah, on top on the roofs we got our living areas, of course. It's more like, like a factory. I would say it's like a factory where living and working comes together with, without any certain borders. And of course in the basement we got our top secret production studios uh, where we try, still try to invent new music all the time. Um. It looked like someone was trying to break in into those studios because I think for about two years constant there was big diggers um, right in front of the, yeah, yeah, the we, building. We had, to <laughs> yeah, we, had to, we had to do a lot uh, to build the studios because the architectural situation was very difficult and we had to fix some, uh, some certain laws with the government because we need our you know, some, we, we have to build some strange things to get allowed to build this because, um, the, you know, these, uh, the laws you need in, 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 in Germany, especially in Cologne, they're very strict and very hard. So um, at that stage, like, had you ever had any moments where you're like, oh gosh. Yes, of course, I had more than one time, yeah. 
Some, sometimes it's getting, it's sometimes, oh, it's really, it's too big, it's too much, it's too much work and too much unnecessary work. But when it's done, you know why you did it and then you feel well. Okay, but in the second when you can't really see that it will ever be done, how do you keep going on? Yeah, when, when, you when you're stuck in the middle of this production process and you see like, like big diggers, for example, standing in front of you and said, hey, what have you done? Is this techno anymore? But yeah, but then you started and you're stuck in the middle and then you have, yeah, you just have to do it. Okay, now, <clears throat> now that studio is finally done, like, um, who are you sharing your rooms with? Yeah, I, I share my rooms or we share our rooms, of course, with, first of all, with our in-house producers at, at Compact in Cologne, which is, of course, my old colleague, Jörg Borger. Maybe somebody might know him for his production, The Modernist. My brother, Reinhardt, Michael Meyer, of course, and uh, a guy called Super Pitcher, which somebody might know. We're stuck all together in the studios downstairs in the basement, every, every, we all got our rooms and we got the center and the recording room and of course we got a little bar which we need, everybody can imagine. And from time to time we got some guests, national guests, international guests, which we produce over there or produce together, just get creative. And of course we also got um, really natural instruments in our studio, like really drum kits and really bass and stuff, not only computers, yeah, for handmade <coughs> music. <laughs> Yeah, there's the, the handmade elements and there's also a little club PA as well in one of the rooms. Yeah, in my room there's standing a real club PA, which is, uh, first of all, it's big fun, you know, so you have your own discotheque in the house. This is always good when you produce music like this. And of course you need it just for technical reasons, because you need a realistic reference. If you want to produce club music, the best thing you could do is, if you have a chance while you're producing, to listen like it would sound in clubs and therefore you need a club PA. And the difficult thing is when you in the, live in the center of, of a private house, in the center of a big city, you can imagine uh, you need really uh, uh, special isolated rooms to rule an old club uh, um, PA in your own rooms because you got neighbors, you know. <laughs> Now, Jörg Borger and you, you collaborators for quite a while, on and off, and um, I think the first time people heard about you was um, uh, when people like Sven Fed and DJs in Berlin as well um, started to play Borger Inc. records in like, what, 91 that was? Or? Yeah, in 91, around about 91, we had our first relevant and let's say successful records, which really DJs, like you mentioned, they really played it, they liked it, and it was the first uh, first steps in this kind of music where we both together, me and Boga, getting popular with this music, yeah. Well, getting back to the influences and how you do you, um, I remember this um, great York Boga quote when he talks about um, seeing his first 909, you know, do you know that story? Or? T tell me. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I hope for a first person yeah. account, no. But I think in <clears throat> essence it was like um, for quite a while trying to get certain kinds of drum sounds and a yeah. certain punch and so on yeah. and listening to these records and trying to imagine like, ooh, what is this thing? How, how did they make this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, when, when this all starts, it was really, it was really a secret how, uh, how certain producers, uh, which we really loved for the record, especially for the, for the Detroit produ producers, how did they do this? You know? And we were wondering in studios, tried to find out what kind of machines do they use, because it was not really known. There was, not, there was no really uh, communication around uh, via magazines, for example, where you can read, okay, this producer used this instrument like you have it today. Today, if you want to know how a new producer is working, you just look to certain magazines and then you know, or to his website or whatever. But uh, back in these days, it, it was not possible. It took you a long time to find out how, do you, how they use it. And we try to do this music definitely with the wrong instruments and it never sounds that good like our idols, you know. Till of course my friend Boga, these days who is much more involved into instruments and equipment, found out about the legendary Ronin machines like the 303 and the 909. And the first time we touched machines like this, it was really like getting in contact with God. <laughs> yeah, but um, I also remember him being slightly disappointed as in like, what? What, that's all? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. 
it was really this little machine makes that wonderful sound, you know. I never was uh, interested so much in learning in instrument. It was not so much my thing, and I was, to be honest, I was too lazy to learn all these manuals and stuff. Um, but when the first time I got the 303, and I was really a massive acid fan, and on the first view, it looks complicated, but for me, it was totally clear. You have to learn this. You want to understand this machine. <coughs> and I did, and I really, I really get disciplined to learn this machine. It was very important. But it was the first time, the time before, I used to play drums. You just need sticks and push on the drums. It was easier, you know. So um, how long did it take you for, to realize, like, OK, we don't get that fat booming 808, 909 sound, but we got, might have something of our own that's worth something. You mean before we got these instruments? Yeah, no. yeah till the moment uh, we got them and we heard them the first time. We, we, we used to go to a studio in, uh, in Belgium these days and produce our first tracks. <laughs> And then um, we How saw. How did you find out about that studio? In the uh, first we, place? we used to to work together with with a with a German producer, which lives around the corner, and he, um, yeah, he invests in our creativity and said, "You want to do this music?" We sent the, we we give him some demos, and then um, he found out the right studio, which was one in Belgium these days, and he sends us there. And then we get in touch with these legendary machines the first time, and the moment you push the bottom, you found out. You never can sound like uh, like your idols or like anybody else's record if you don't have these machines, because it's the only way to sound like this. And then, how did you find your own machines? Like, how mm -hmm. did you make, mm -hmm. or was it more like techniques and the way mm -hmm. you used other things? Uh, these days, these machines have already been what we would call today vintage. You know, you have to check out the second-hand market because these machines at this time already has been a few years old, and the equipment market is very fast. They already have been sold out. You couldn't buy it new in shops. Um, because they were coming from the early 80s, from hip-hop music, of course. Yeah, and then you have to check the second-hand market, and these instruments, they're getting very fast, very expensive these days, because uh, the guys who got those machines, they found out it's very rare and popular, and uh, they get not reproduced anymore by the company Roland, for example, so they get very expensive very fast, even more expensive in second-hand than they have been new, than the price was when they were new. <clears throat> um, now, <clears throat> especially unlike Jörg, you're not exactly the biggest gearhead in the world. Like, how do you actually use your tools? Oh, I would say like very anarchistic. No, it, it's it's hard to say. Normally, when when I used to, when I used to produce together with Jörg, he is much more into these equipment things, and I was lucky to say that he was the one who who builds all the situation and combines the stacks, and he was able to build you know a, a, a MIDI situation and all this stuff. And I was always the one who came in when it was done in a way. Yeah, in the uh, in the early days. Later, when we start working more with with first computers and. With, uh, with all these early programs like first creator of course um, and all this stuff um, <coughs> yeah we, we learned parallel and then I get much more educated into these things um, speaking of education is this probably the time to give the voices a rest and listen to some profan for example for example it depends on what you want to hear we got some examples from noise to nice <laughs> from so hard to noise so. nice where noise, do you want nice. to go noise nice hmm. lethargy um. get a week get awake or, or want to sleep noise you want to have a noise example loud noise i give you i give you something really special Okay, where do we got this? You know, I'm the I'm the best DJ in the world. I don't find any records. By the way, I've never been a DJ. You know, I never I never I was never able to combine with two record players music because I'm only producer. You know, I never understood how they could do this. I was always impressed. Okay. Nevertheless, you seem to favor vinyl heavily. Yeah, vinyl. Yeah. <laughs> What's it? Uh, what did you call it? The king medium? Uh, you like that? <laughs> it's
good to get awake again, isn't it? Yeah, Michael Meyer, beware. There might be competition in your own house now. Of course. He might get jealous. Uh, um, questions? Anyone? That record is called MI5. It's from uh, uh, yeah, original is 92. It's a repressing from 95 on the label called Auftrieb. However you translate that into English. Sorry? However you translate Auftrieb into English. Auftrieb, in, oh, it's this is... air that air lifts you up. Air kinda. that lifts you up, but it's uh. coming from somewhere else. Normally, Auftrieb on the one thing means, um, it's of course it's a German word, yeah, and it means that air that's moving up, on the one side it's the push from coming from down when air is coming from down. And it's got a second meaning, it's because when in Bavaria, um, the people, the I don't know the word, the passion, they, they bring up the cows in spring uh, uh, for the summer season uh, into the mountains, you know, to eat the grass, what they do. What they do, this is called auftrieb, to bring up the cows up the tree. So what's MI5? Is it another section of the uh, KGB MI5 or CIA? Has, or? Yeah, yeah, it is, of course. It, it, it's, uh, it has two meanings. It, has, it means, um, on the one side, it means uh, Mike Inc. 5. And then it's, of course, it's MI5, the, uh, the English Secret Service. And it means, I only can explain it in German, it's called Maßstab 1 zu 5. This is a term out of, um, can you explain it? What means Maßstab 1 zu 5? It's measures, right? Measures, measures yeah. 1 to 5? If, if you use like a map and it's like um, something that's magnified by yeah. the ratio of 5 to 1. Yeah, and it's uh, it's coming out of more out of the uh, of of the ar architecture language, and it, it's uh, this is this record is not uh, not good example. I give you one last example for something. What I mean with MI5 is under the project name of MI5, I used I used uh, to use a certain theory in music, while I used uh, to push uh, I got a rhythmic sample based on the loop, just boof boof boof, you know. And I let it run on the original key, in the original speed, and on top of it, I push the same button five notes below, from C to G. That's a large fifth. In yes, the exactly, exactly. And um, this gives a certain kind of relation in rhythm, two contradictive beats which run together and build a new beat. And this is the relation of one to five, because it reads five notes down. I can give you an example for this. Might be interesting. This is what was later popular under the name of abstract techno on the label Profan. This is just drum beats combined in, in the measure step of five notes below, which sounds very strange, of course. Okay, this is how music uh, MI5 sounds when it's only beat, then it sounds very easy and you can understand it. The same idea or the same method sounds like this when there's also harmony involved. Of course, it's very abstract and you can imagine not so many DJs will play this music. Yeah. What? Thank you very much. Do we have some questions from the floor, please? Is the mic? Yes. The mic. Yes, hi. Um, uh, I'm not really a, a great fan of techno, but um, I, I am a great fan of house music on, on the whole. Um, I was wondering if, like, in terms of, okay, let's look at me. Um, I feel the music that I make, um, I feel it very emotional. Sometimes um, I was wondering, is there any any particular emotion that we, you, you you would describe you feel every time when you make that music? You mean what? Yeah, like what, what type kind of, of emotion? Emotion have when I yeah, produce? Or yeah. what? I would I would say I never I never I cannot imagine or remember to do to that I ever did music without any emotion or without any emotion getting involved. It depends on what kind of emotion. I I absolutely understand if anybody don't understand, let's say, the emotional aspect of what I do or what anybody else might do. This is very, it's a very private thing, you know, like emotion is, it's very subjective in a way. Um, 
on the one side, I always I got a very uh, theoretic thing going on. O also, this is very much about thinking. The most music I did, but uh, it would never happen without any emotional <coughs> side or emotional aspect. For me, this is all full of feelings and emotions. And I used to say I, I never did any music without giving my heart blood into it. You know, I've never I've never never made cold music for me. Uh, and I never listened to cold music. But of course, this is a question of taste, you know. So even in techno music, music which a lot of people might think they're cold. I, I will give you an example which might be interesting, um, where a lot of people might say, where is the emotional side in this kind of music? Because there is no harmonies involved and there's nothing. It's a very radical example for a minimal track, which I think is one of the most emotional for I ever did, and I'm, and I'm known for, and I guess you might not hear what I mean, because it's, for me, it's in a very fantastic and emotional way. It's really nearly nothing, but in the best way you can imagine what nothing could be. You think it's emotional? we have it's absolutely minimal you know I can't stop it here because I can explain it's nearly going on like this it's nearly like an endless loop you know I could really could have cut it like a loop but it's not it's happening very very rarely thing just a little bit of emphasizing and really nothing the ingredients are definitely definitely cold it's coming from uh, um, from a Yamaha machine it's even not sampling you know so there might be a lot of reasons why we can say this has no certain warm quality, no heart, no emotion, but for me it's full of emotion, you know. Mm. I'm standing in this loop, been feeling surrounded by tons of emotion. But yeah. of course you have to feel it and of course it's a question of taste. I un would understand everybody who say I feel nothing with this, I understand this. Yeah, Maybe I, I even I, take it like a compliment <laughs> in a way. Yeah, I must say um, I really find it interesting that um, you, you feel very emotional and this um, art of nothing. I, I like the term that you put it, like the art of minim the, the minimal art, yes. you know, because um, you can you, you can feel something that is very, um, like a, a very uh, solid product, and to someone else it will feel very uh, emotional, uh, like it doesn't make sense of uh, to, to some people. Like I find, I find mm. people who don't understand my music as well, mm. but you, you find me... Yeah. Um, yeah. In a state of crying sometimes, but somebody else will be like, "Hey, you mad? You crazy?" Like, um, you know. Of course, yeah. it's. I think it's it, it's uh, it's really clear that it's easier to explain people that maybe say like like a wonderful ballad of Smokey Robinson might be more emotional on the first in the first view in the first way of feeling like this. Of course, I would agree on this because I love ballads of Smokey Robinson, for example. Mm -hmm. But for me, this is also full of emotion because I'm not able to produce any art or any music without emotion. Motion. You see all these great pictures hanging around here, yeah. which is is, on, is on, only to isolate the acoustics here. For me, they're totally warm and nice, you know, yeah. because I, I like this gray very much. It touches me. For me, it's full of emotion, and yeah. it's, it's a question of taste, you know. Yeah. And Thanks very much. Thanks. You're welcome. <clears throat> Looks like good German steel. Yeah. Warm steel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. Um, I'm not either a fan of techno music, of techno music. Actually, like this last week, I've been listening to more techno and house than in my whole life. And I, I'm, since you, you like you talked about Kraftwerk many times, and I'm a big fan of Kraftwerk, I'd like to know why this drum pattern in the electronic music, like the dance music as a whole, has never changed. 
Like Kraftwerk ha had many different patterns, like that influenced Miami bass and other funky. You stuff. mean by in techno, it's it's always the same beat. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I, I get many different of the the synthesizers and the rhythm as a general in many, even in percussions and all that. But I I, I would like to know why 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 you think that. It never changed like the, the same bass drum like straight up. Because this is the heart of techno, you know. The, the, the main thing of techno is the four to the floor bass drum. If you leave that out, it's not techno anymore. This this is, you know, this is the main idea. This is this is, how can I say? This is the religion of techno, if you like. But you this is this was something that in the beginning it was like set up. Okay, everybody who's doing techno got to have this straight up drum. Drum yeah. pattern. Yeah, there, there's one non-verbal worldwide main language which combines people who are involved into techno, and this is the bass drum. Anything else on top of the bass drum, even thousand imaginary variations of beat are allowed on techno, but you can never change the bass drum. This is just, an, it's an untouchable rule in a way. You know, this is this is very important for this music. Otherwise, it's not techno anymore. In other ways of music, even in hip hop, you know, they got so many interesting, amazing, great beats, and they got much opportunities of doing variations, being faster, being slower, being you know laid back and and steady and very abstract, and it's still hip hop because you you will recognize hip hop on on different sides, but on techno, it's still the bass drum, you know. There's a certain idea when you run run around uh, in, in the side of clubs or you've been on the parking place in front of a techno club, what you always hear is the bass drum. When your neighbor listens to techno, it's the bass drum. The rest is free, you know. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, hi, I was wondering about Compact. Um, well, two things, really, just generally I'm curious um, about where you're taking Compact next, in the future, next couple of years. Um, also, I'm wondering about all the sub-labels. It seems that they've been kind of shifting shapes a lot lately, like a, a sub-label for Compact that would be known for just putting out really hard techno would release an ambient tune um, all of a sudden, and, and a sub-label that was known to release new artists would release a really old classic compact artist is is that was that like a conscious thing to sort of confuse record buyers or listeners so I, i'm curious about that and and the future of compact if, if there's any plan yeah maybe the second question of course we're well known of surprising the people you know we, we invented all these sub labels uh, um, first of all uh, to to uh, for for a certain kind of sound idea even for for hard techno or for ambient stuff at a certain point, we feel like surprising ourselves and even our audience with yeah with surprises in breaking these rules. As I explained in a, in a different example earlier, um, when when rules get too established, we we all get bored by rules. First, our own as artists or as as the one who did the label, and then our audience. And then sometimes we have to wake them, you know, and surprise them with an ambient release on a hardcore techno label. What, what, uh, on the other side, we have to face some uh, uh, the market reality because the musical market, especially for the physical for records, like most of you might know, have changed radically in the last years. It was uh, in the earlier years it was much easier because it was easier to sell record because records was was the main way to transport this music. Meanwhile, we got all these files and all these. MP3 uh, culture, um, which makes it harder um, uh, to sell uh, physical records. So you have, um, yeah, you have to be very careful, and you have to make decisions. Just of course, unfortunately, for marketing reasons, which you might not have done uh, in years earlier. You know, and even uh, to come to the first part of the question, the future of the label in general is. Um, is first of all to go on like we are, to stay interesting, to surprise still ourselves and of course our audience and the people, but also have to face all the reality and also the problems in the market. Also the market changes our release policy, of course. But I think as long as this music is existing like this, we will go on like this. Um, I'd just like to add that also that one of the biggest techno tracks of this year um, by Patrice Bommel, Roar, I don't know if you heard it, it, it's on Get Physical, it has no kick drum. Oh, and 
but I guess it's got still a, a four to the floor feeling measure. Uh, it's, kind of, yeah. And I yeah. think he's a former participant is, as well. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's yeah. interesting. Uh, it's from time to time, even to come back to his question, uh, let's say every 10,000 techno release record, it's even possible to leave out the bass drum bit between two other tracks with bass drum. If, if you go on thinking this idea of techno very radical to the end, of course, it's possible to leave out the bass drum like in breaks. You know, in techno, the bass drum only goes out to come back. You know, when you stand on the floor, it's wonderful when it goes out just to come back. Very rarely in very good tracks is possible to leave it out to use this special release, this track between other tracks. And, but you keep the feeling. The DJ can keep the feeling of the way it keeps it existing even if the people don't hear it. But the feeling is still techno. There are some very interesting rhythms in this track that sort of take it away from just the bass drum parodying. So I think it's cool. But thanks. You're welcome. I would like to know if you are in love with some special analog equipment from the 60s made in Germany. <laughs> 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 yeah, like this tape yeah, delay. There, is there, is st there is still this this no nostalgic thing we all have with all these old instruments, like like the MOOCs. Not even only from Germany, also the the, the, the well known German machines. For me, I never had such an so much emotional relationship to these kind of machines like some friends i know who have them in in glass furniture and clean them up every day and kiss them every morning you know no i never had that emotional feeling to machines i was always in love in the sound they make and and when i listen to records which i really love and influence me and i found out oh it's this machine okay i gotta have it you know but uh, i'm not the one who is praying every day and thank god for these machines i like them but Honestly, I can also live without them. Thank you. Hey, I wanted to ask whether there's a sexuality to compact, whether it's camp or whether it wants to be kind of ambiguous, and whether that comes from, say, the history of Cologne clubs or whether that now comes out in a kind of, there's a personality that's played out in the new Pet Shop Boys release that you guys have. You mean you mean the sexual side of compact? It's, well, uh, where we stand? Uh, no, just uh, whether that's a yeah. part of the stylistic and part of, of the course, aesthetic. For, for us, it's very, very important to be very open-minded. We always used to look for a very good vote in every direction, you know. This is uh, just one reason why I think we represent uh, the, 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 whole, the whole palette, if you like, of, of, of any option. And, every direction of course we got no uh, no certain direction and we're not afraid of any tendencies yeah just i mean because i think <laughs> if there's an interesting kind of thing if you've got certain kind of very camp feel in some kind of italo disco yeah and that kind of world and you can have this kind of detroit techno being quite masculine and quite male yeah. but if i think of all of you guys if i think of you michael and axel and things there's a bit more fluidity and you know, whether there's a conscious desire to be ambiguous uh huh. Yeah, I, I cannot really explain where it's coming from. You know, it's it's just our our feeling, our, our lifestyle in a way, which 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 you feel, of course, in the way we do our music. You know, it's for for, for certain times we, we we're looking more for for these kind of of of, of musical language, if you mm -hmm. like, or styles, and sometimes more on the other side. It's I, I cannot really explain. It's just coming by nature. You know, there's no certain. Or can I explain no certain idea or, or it's, it's, is it maybe more real on the dance floor? Yeah, it's yeah, it's really it's it's just happening. Thank you. Any more participant questions, <laughs> please? And yes, for the record, Cologne is a gay capital, if that's what you asked. And we're happy with that, all of us. So in in the compact building. In the basement, you have a, a room with a club PA system, and it's completely sound isolated. So it sounds like a great place for an afters party here. So you, you mean in our in our in our shop? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So, like, do you have after parties back there? Uh, uh, ah, okay, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, we used to have this earlier. Uh, uh, to, to be honest, meanwhile, this uh, uh, tradition is gone a bit. But in 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 earlier times and earlier years, we used also to have. Uh, 
spontaneous after parties or parties directly in the shop, you know, in front of all the best records you can get. It's easy to do. Mm. Yeah, drink some beer with some customers and then you close the job and the party starts. It, it's Today it happens really rarely. We're equipped to do this, of course, in the shop. And of course, we're allowed to do this. But honestly, um, after all these years, it's getting more rare. In, in earlier years, we had this like every day, <laughs> no, <laughs> twice a week. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, which brings you probably to round this off uh, into an interesting um, new um, paradigm. Because obviously, you, you talked a lot about earlier how this youthful energy and stuff, and I mean, obviously, without hinting at anything, but you're definitely not 17 anymore. And a 17-year-old definitely has like a totally different lifestyle. Nevertheless, a lot of your music is consumed by people at their peak of energy levels and stuff. Um, how do you prevent yourself from, despite being techno with body and soul, um, to become like a Rolling Stones character mm. within the techno scenario? Maybe I'm one of the first uh, that we all find out that it's possible to get a Rolling Stones character uh, in techno or might, I might get the Cologne Mick Jagger of techno. I don't know. No, I don't think age is really, and I say it really from the bottom of my heart, it's not important in this music. It's no question of age, you know. It, for me, it's a question yeah, of credibility and a question of lifestyle. You know? Of course, I'm not 17 anymore and of course, I'm not so much interested anymore in having party like like 17 year old guys because this energy is totally different but on the other side there's really a, a, a constant a, um, a connection uh, in techno between all these generations. I would say meanwhile we have three four or five it depends on how you see it generations in techno um, and there's still a strong connection you know I, I, I live in techno I, I do nothing else I'm involved into techno every every day more or less in different kind of ways. So it's just a question, yeah, of, of credibility. If, if people don't want that anymore, or don't want you anymore, or don't feel you credibility, credible anymore, you will find out very fast in a way. And it's, it's a combination. On the one side, you, you, you're getting adult in a way, and older with techno, and you find new positions, even in supporting younger artists, of course, and pushing them. But on the other side, there is still this wonderful experience where we all under, uh, are the same on the dance floor, you know. Well, I'd say rave of fists in the air, and thank you, Wolfgang Vogt. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.